Good morning and welcome to worship at Beulah Presbyterian Church on this October the 4th, World Communion Sunday, a Sunday in which all over the world we are united with our brothers and sisters in Christ in a unique way in which we all celebrate the Holy Sacrament of Communion. It is also the day in which we collect one of the National Church's offerings, and that is Peace and Global Witness offering. And 25% of the offering that is collected at Beulah will remain here at Beulah to support our peace initiatives. We are so glad that you are here, either by Facebook, or YouTube, or sermon by phone. So let us prepare our hearts and minds to worship God. Good morning. Would you please join me in the call to worship? Come in from the night. It is a new day, and this is where love lives. Take off your coat. Let the weight fall off of your shoulders. For here you are known. Here you are loved. Come in from the rain. We can do anything together. We can survive together. When the world unravels from under your feet, come in. Come in. God is here. You are home. You will never be alone. Let us worship the God who weaves us together. Amen. And to that, the people said, Amen. Amen. Would you please join me in the prayer for confession? Holy God, we have been angry because we see suffering and we don't understand. We have been skeptical because we know heartbreak that doesn't seem fair. We have withheld love because sacrifice only feels real when it's our own. Forgive us for withholding our pain from you. Forgive us for thinking that we know everything. When the world falls apart around us, when love unravels and life slowly fails, draw us in. Show us grace. For you gave the wind its weight, and you gave our bodies life. Forgive us for forgetting that. Amen. Righteousness does not come from our own doing or not doing. Righteousness comes from God by faith. Through the faithfulness of Christ our Lord, we are forgiven. Wherever you are, however you can share, Share the peace of Christ with those around you, perhaps by saying a short prayer to pass the peace to someone who needs it. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pass the peace to you.
Join me in saying the prayer of illumination. God of unending surprises, this life is a tapestry of moments woven together and we long to be weavers of love. Today we gather and pray that you would unravel our bias, unravel our assumptions, unravel what it is that keeps us from you. And as you do, clear space in our hearts for your word. We are listening. We are praying. Amen. <clears throat> A reading from the book of Job. But where shall wisdom be found? And where is the place of understanding? Mortals do not know the way to it, and it is found, and not found in the land of the living. The deep says to me, it is not in me. And the sea says, it's, it is not within me. I can, it cannot be gotten for gold, and silver cannot be weighed out as its price. It cannot be valued in the gold of Ophir, in precious onyx and sapphire. Gold and glass cannot equal it, nor can it be exchanged for jewels of fine gold. No mention shall be made of coral or of crystal. The price of wisdom is above pearls. The chrysolite of Ethiopia cannot compare with it, nor can it be valued in pure gold. Where then does wisdom come from? And where is this the place of understanding? It is hidden from the eyes of all living and concealed from the birds of the air. Abaddon and Death say, we have heard a rumor of it with our ears. God understands the way to it and he knows its place. For he looks to the ends of the earth and seeks everything under heaven. Under the heavens. When he gave to the wind its weight and apportioned out the waters by measure, when he made a decree for the rain and a way for the thunderbolt. And then he saw and declared it and he established it and he searched it out and he said to humankind, truly, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to depart from evil is understanding. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I have to tell you, I don't like the book of Job. <laughs> Next to Isaiah, I think it's one of the most difficult books in the Old Testament. But we're beginning a new sermon series today, a series about Unraveled. When the plans that we have fall apart, when we accidentally pulled on that fine thread and before we knew it, the hem came out of our shirt, the buttons came off our, our blouse, and our beautiful hand-woven tapestry rug became a pile of mishmashed and tangled fiber. So, as Governor Andy says, we're all in this together, so we're gonna jump into Job because I don't know what better biblical character epitomizes the sense of their life being unraveled, of a sense of lament and loss, rather than Job. So here we go. In the very first sentence, of the book of Job, the problem that is unpacked, unraveled, if you will, in the book is articulated. And here's, here's the issue. What if there was a wonderfully pious and righteous person who ended up with nothing, nothing except pain and rejection due to no fault of his or her own? 
Just what sort of a universe would one be living in then? And ultimately, who may we say God is? the supposed creator of the universe in a world where this happens. Our hero of the tale, Job, is a man of virtue and integrity. And that's judged by any, any standard available, by his marriage, by his children, by his wealth, by uh, the animals that he has, the friends that he has. He is as good in the final chapters of the book of Job as he is at the very beginning in chapter 1. And while this fabulously righteous Job is demonstrating in every possible way just how righteous he is, a scene is unfolding up above in the skies over his head. The Satan, meaning something like the spy, asked God a very important and crucial question. Um, is Job really in awe of you, God, for nothing? In other words, is Job's piety completely without desire, without expectation of reward, or does Job expect goodies? for being good. After all, Job is comfortable and rich, revered in honor. So the Satan says, stretch out your hand now, touch all that Job has, and he will curse you to your face. And God is apparently very interested in this case and bids the Satan to just do that. Go ahead, stretch out your hand. But God commands the Satan not to touch Job himself. And the Satan does that. Now, this is a critical caveat, very critical caveat. Whatever the word the Satan means, this fellow is a regular of God's court. He's not some sort of devilish adversary against God. His role in serving God is to observe the actions of the human beings and to report those actions back to God. This isn't a guy with a t red tail, with a pitchfork, and horns. Not in the book of Job. And in four swift hammer blows that we only assume Thor could wield, Job loses everything. And Job responds to all this tragedy with a well-worn proverb. Naked I came from my mother's womb, naked I shall return. God gave and God has taken away. Blessed be God's name. And in all this, the text says, Job didn't sin or charge God with wrongdoing. Now, the heavenly scene that I just told you about, it's repeated. But this time, the Satan is given permission by God to attack Job's body with foul disease. But again, Job refuses to knuckle under. It's at this point that Job's three friends now appear. Having heard of his troubles on Facebook, they come running. They travel to see him, presumably to console and comfort him, and not just put smiley or sad faces or crying faces on the Facebook feed. However, their immediate actions bear no whiff of consolation or no order of comfort. As they will make plain ad nauseum in their speeches, Job has gotten from God what he deserves, for God always rewards the righteous 
and punishes the wicked. Hmm. Job's location on the heap of ashes and his deplorable physical condition are clear signs that his evil is vast and the friends want no part of it. If you do good, you get good. If you do bad, you get bad. Well, that is the way and will of God. At least that's the friend's choral refrain. Job finds his friends models of scrupulousness, boring and unconvincing. So he mocks them and dismisses them with dripping sarcasm and scorn. Their argument, if you do good, you get good. If you do bad, you get bad, seems designed only to undermine his self-confidence, shatter his self-esteem, and make him feel bad. Everything Job holds dear. His property, his family, his wealth, his physical health has been taken from him. And reduced to suffering and misery, Job laments his circumstances and tries to make sense of what has happened to him. His friends remain silent, hoping Job too will remain silent in his misery. <laughs> but the joke's on them. Job is many things, but silent isn't one of them. And after his rebuke of these so-called friends, we don't hear from them again. If Job wasn't so good, writes Walter Brueggemann, we might consider him to be arrogant. But Job is good. He is morally good. He is theologically good, discerning, and responsible. He knows what serious theology is all about. And he understands what healthy humanness costs. He knows how to will one thing. And that one thing is to live a responsible, caring, compassionate generous life. Not many of us would ever be cast in the role of Job. So let's stop right here at the end of the first couple of chapters. How you doing? You've got the tale so far. Okay. So, so far we know, okay, all we have to do, and it is doable, is to be blameless before the Lord our God. Hmm. Is that enough? No, it's not enough. A life of integrity, of getting it right and living it well, in the end, isn't enough. It's not enough because mm, trouble comes. Mainly, however, it's not enough, says Brueggemann, because we are created and ordained for a deeper, more demanding sense of relationship with the Almighty God, a relationship that creates a restlessness in us, probably a restlessness that a lot of us are feeling right now in a world that has layer upon layer of pandemics. It's that other restlessness beyond virtue, so elusive and so urgent that both satisfies us and places us in crisis. That restlessness beyond virtue is a yearning, a yearning for a conversation, a communion, a transaction that outruns integrity and isn't preoccupied with our goodness. Goodness isn't enough. And in the end, it, quite frankly, it's uninteresting and it's not satisfying. Job's restlessness at this point is because he seeks a conversation partner who will address him at the point of where he is in his anguish and turmoil and will transform him. Job learned what we will all learn sooner or later, 
Integrity doesn't give life. Being right is no substitute for being amazed. Controlling won't substitute for yielding to awe and wonder and amazement. Job, and I think even more so his friends, are models of ideological certitude. That kind of moral certitude doesn't matter ultimately because we are not saved by our virtue. We brood in our virtue. We brag about our virtue, confident that those other people are without credibility. We live in a society of preferred virtues, of convinced moralities, of exacting, restless ideologies. As with Job, these idols of self-congratulations, they block our healing. They make us feel falsely at ease. They prevent transformation and they reduce life to a set of slogans. Brueggemann points out that the alternative good news of the book of Job is that like our hero, we too are made for that second conversation that surprises us and that we can never anticipate. So after Job rants and raves and then becomes petulantly silent like a three-year-old, Job is addressed by the thereness of God, who is simply there, there for Job and after Job, but also there for Job. God is there for Job, but refuses, refuses to engage Job on Job's terms. Instead, there's the language of power and awe and mystery and amazement, daring, astonishment, miracles, the inscrutable lyrical language of what Brueggemann calls doxology. We all know the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God, all creatures here below. Praise God above ye, heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Job, like us, knows how to do doxology, but he has forgotten, liberated praise when he was pressed too close and thought he had to defend himself. Job stands before the one who asks sovereign questions, who calls to account, who blows Job off the map by daring to show how limited and contained and small is Job's field of vision, and he recontextualizes Job's integrity. No one, not even Job, can stand in the face of the whirlwind on a soapbox of virtue. So what happens when our worlds fall apart? How do we press onward when our tightly knit plans unravel into loose threads? What do we become when our identity or the path we're on comes undone? What if all of this is not the end we fear it will be? In our unraveling, Sometimes life surprises us with unexpected joy, love, and hope. With a new beginning, we couldn't have imagined. Sometimes we need God to unravel us, or we long to be transformed. That's what happened to Job. He was unraveled, and then he was transformed. by the mystical, amazing, powerful, everlasting God.
Unraveling isn't always the end we fear it will be. When the worst has happened, when death or tragedy has undone us and the vision we had for our lives tears apart and we come to an end, but it's not the end. Our story continues. Sometimes unraveling becomes an opportunity to untangle ourselves from broken patterns or toxic situations or to become unwound from a path or an identity that no longer serves us. We don't have to dig deep to think of moments when our life hasn't gone as planned. We probably just have to think to this morning or to yesterday. One day we're moving through the world with hopes and dreams on our sleeves. The next we're laughing out loud. Or are we lost in a wave of grief for the way life has unfolded around us? It's a messy reality. That's probably why I don't like the book of Job. It's messy. But my friends, we all know this. Life is messy. But it's a reality in which the holy, awesome, amazing, everlasting God surprises us by moving in and around us in these moments. Weaving together the loose ends of grief and isolation or loss in our life while also unraveling prejudice, injustice, and suffering. Yep, things don't always go as planned. Sometimes that's good, and sometimes that's extremely painful. Either way, the Holy Spirit is always working to help us keep things together by going before us and behind us and weaving in those loose threads. And that's worth paying attention to and saying, praise God, from whom all blessings flow. Thanks be to God. Amen. On this day, people of faith all over the world gather at Christ's table in languages as diverse as God's people and tables of every size and shape. We proclaim together the unity of our life in Christ. This is not a Presbyterian table. This is not Beulah's table. And this is not only a table for those with whom we agree. This table belongs to Christ and extends to every corner of the earth and every person on earth. On World Communion Sunday, may joy be made complete. May we share 
and one mind that is centered in Christ our Lord, in one love, and in one spirit. Please join me in the great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right to give you praise, O God. You created the world and all that is in it. The startling diversity of the earth and its creatures were made by you, and you pronounced it good. You created for yourself a world filled with diversity and blessed by your breath of life. A tapestry of people of all colors an assortment of culture and life. You called us into life-giving partnership with each other and you, but instead we choose to seek dominance and bring about division. We have betrayed each other and denied your image, which is present in every person regardless of race, age, gender, sexual orientation, ethnicity, ability, our vocation. But in each place of shadow and pain and in every divisive moment, you have sought us out again to reflect the beauty and diversity of your grace and to reconcile us to one another and to you. Holy are you, God of grace, and blessed is Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, choosing to leave the shelter of heaven he comes to gather us into a new family. Your son, Jesus, came as a servant to wash away our pride and feed us with the bread of life. We praise you for inviting us to serve one another without pride, to forgive one another as we have been forgiven, and to feast at his table as members of one household. God of mystery, send your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these gifts of bread and cup. Prepare us to receive your presence and to know your grace. May this one bread nourish our bodies and may it nourish the fullness of our lives. May this cup that we share wet our parched and silent throats and may it quench our deep and yearning thirst. Here at this table, may we remember the table in the upper room. Tables of abundance many of us enjoy at home. The empty tables of the poor and hungry and the banquet table in the life to come. Let this meal reshape our every meal so that the justice and mercy known here will become our way of life. May we become a people for whom the hunger pains of the poorest child will disrupt the feasting of the satisfied. There is enough food for all, enough peace for all, enough love for all, enough hope for all, enough grace for all. In this truth and in this hope, we proclaim the mystery of our faith until you appear among us again. We ask your Holy Spirit's presence and guidance in a broken world grasping for wholeness. May the church yearn to proclaim the good news of a world made new and a mercy wider than imaginations can span. We pray this through Christ our Lord. Amen. May God teach us to pray continually the prayer our risen Savior taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. After table fellowship with his friends, 
Christ took the bread and blessed it, and then he broke it. And he said, take, eat, remember me. And in the same manner, Christ took the cup and said, this is the cup of the new covenant poured out for you in my blood for the forgiveness of sins and the promise of eternal life. Drink and remember me. And as often as you eat of the bread and drink of the cup, do so remembering me. Friends, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. Wherever you are, celebrate communion with something to drink and something to eat. And know that on this World Communion Sunday, we are all united at Christ's table. Thanks be to God. Please join me in the prayer after communion. Let us pray. Gracious God, we offer our thanks for the whole communion of saints witness to this feast and for the ministry of churches around the world who gather with us today. By this broken bread, may we each be restored for the work yet to come. By this shared cup, May we each be claimed for the proclamation of your kingdom. At this shared table, may we be united as children of your promise, children of your word, dying and made new again, sent boldly together into the world as servants of your peace. Amen. Depart now in the fellowship of God the Father Almighty, and as you go, remember. By the goodness of God, you were born into this world. By the grace of God, you have been kept all the day long, even until this very moment. And by the love of God, fully revealed in the face of Jesus Christ, you are being redeemed. And may the blessing of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you this day and every day. Amen. <laughs>